Back in November, we posed a quiz question to you in an episode of Business Matters, asking you how much longer it would take for ships if they took the route all around Africa to go from Asia to Europe instead of the shorter Suez Canal route. At that time, we truly didn't expect that this would become a topic of discussion in a future episode of Business Matters. Hello and welcome back to Business Matters of the Hindu with me, K. Bharat Kumar. The Suez Canal sees cargo worth more than 15% of global trade passing through it annually. Ever since the Houthi rebels began attacking merchant ships in October last following Israel's assault on the Gaza Strip, shipping trade through the canal has been impacted. In a blog post on the IMF website, the Portwatch portal estimated that the volume of trade transiting the Suez Canal had plummeted 50% year over year in the first two months of this year. Meanwhile, the volume of trade that was transiting through the Cape of Good Hope had increased 74% compared to last year's levels. And just to give you an idea of how trade routes have changed, here's a chart from the blog post. It tells us that on Jan 1st, 2023, the seven-day moving average in million metric tons via the Suez Canal and that around Africa were comparable. They were 4.52 and 3.63 respectively. Cut to March 4th of this year, that figure for Cape of Good Hope was 7.63 and that for the Suez Canal was a lowly 1.8. That's quite some divergence. A coalition of countries led by the US is now launching counterattacks against the Houthi rebels. But even with the passage of time, the conflict in the Red Sea has continued unabated. And for the first time last week, we saw a fatal attack. Two crew members on a merchant ship, and they happen to be of Filipino origin, died during an attack by the Houthis. Now, what is the impact of this conflict in the Red Sea on India's trade? India uses the Red Sea route to offer trade to markets, obviously in North Africa and parts of West Asia, but our primary targets are the markets in Europe and in the east coast of the US. A business line report from earlier this year indicated that this route would have enabled overall merchandise trade with Europe and North Africa, accounting annually for about 50% of imports and 60% of exports, totaling 113 billion. In January this year, Delhi-based research firm Research and Information System for Developing Countries estimated that India's exports could be impacted by up to $30 billion if the crisis in this region did not subside. And sure enough, such warnings have become only more dire as time passed. In a more recent report, based on a survey by the FIEO, the Federation of Indian Export Organizations, estimated that the impact on our exports could be up to $60 billion. And quite naturally, This has also pushed up the cost of trade. As early as in the first week of January, it would have cost you $1,500 to send a container from India to Saudi Arabia. Before the crisis broke out, that would have cost you less than half, which is $700. At the time, FIEO chief Ajay Sahai had said, all kinds of surcharges are being applied, such as peak season surcharge of $1,500 and Red Sea or contingency surcharge of $1,500 to $3,000. With shipping firms opting for the longer trade route, insurance costs are also going up because the more time you spend out on sea, the more the risk either from mishaps or from pirates. In another sign, the cost of trade is indeed going up. Danish logistics major Maersk announced an increase of a whopping $1,000 per container. Earlier, whenever there was a price increase, Normally, companies used to calibrate these according to the size of the container. In this instance, this was a flat rate applicable to containers of all sizes. Ironically, it was only in October last that the WTO had downgraded its estimates for world merchandise trade growth. This was by about 0.8 percentage points. In an interview late last month with sister publication Business Line, WTO chief economist acknowledged that even those estimates looked optimistic now. He pointed out that Q3 trade data had come in weaker than expected and indicators for Q4 remained subdued. He said this is mainly due to weaker growth in Europe, significantly impacting global trade. But he had also pointed out that the impact of the conflict in the Red Sea was still moderate for global trade thanks to lower freight costs compared to the 2021 peak, moderate demand, strong inventories and available container shipping capacity. He had also pointed out that if the crisis continues, then its impact on inflation and trade, especially in Europe, could worsen significantly. So, 
How long this crisis continues and the impact it will eventually have on global trade is anybody's guess. Even now, the numbers that you see in terms of impact on exports and imports are only estimates. It's only when stocks run out and new orders have to be placed will we know the actual impact of higher costs, delays and the risks involved. As we wind down this episode, as always, here is a nugget of information for you. Did you know that the Silk Road is neither an actual road nor a single route? The term instead refers to a network of routes used by traders for more than 1,500 years. From when the Han dynasty of China opened trade in 130 BCE until 1453 CE, when the Ottoman Empire closed off trade with the West. It extended for about 6,437 kilometers, or roughly 4,000 miles, across some of the world's most formidable landscapes, including the Gobi Desert and the Pamir Mountains. With no one government to provide upkeep, the roads were typically in poor condition. Robbers were common. To protect themselves, traders joined together in caravans with camels or other pack animals. Few people traveled the entire route, giving rise to a host of middlemen and trading posts along the way. That brings us to the final section, the quiz section of our episode. The quiz for this week is what is the code of Hammurabi and when was it developed? And in answer to last week's question, here it goes. What portion of total global defense exports do the top 10 account for? And some of you got it right when you uh, mentioned this in the comment section. The top 10 account for all 90.7 of defense exports globally. These are led by the US, Russia, France and China and with Israel coming up at number 10. That's all we have for you this week, folks. Until we meet again, have a lovely time ahead. And before you go away, do not forget to like, share and subscribe.